up guys all right so this is uh reed young for pokersprout.com and here is a goofy ass video that i'm gonna do for you guys it is the highest possible stakes uh play money that you can buy in for so as ridiculous as it sounds uh these guys are actually pretty solid and as i am a u.s player i am kind of limited to this uh stupid bullshit for online poker <laughs> for uh, unless you want to play some dangerous games. So, you know, there's a, a lot to be said about trying to play online in the U.S. right now. Um, generally, I would advise against it just because of all the risks that you have to take um, in finding a, a solid spot. So, not only do you have to find a place to play in, but you also have to worry about it potentially closing down. It's not regulated. Uh, or if it is regulated, the player pool is very small. The higher stakes games aren't that competitive, uh, unless you have something like the, the World Series of Poker taking place where a lot of people are in Nevada, which is one of the currently regulated states at the time of this recording. Um, and you have a, a solid-sized player pool, but you know at that point, you're probably better off just hopping in a game in your... Uh, you know, whatever casino you choose. So, uh, the main things, uh, common questions I get where it's like, hey, should I be playing online? Should I be playing live? Um, the big difference is online, you would be able to play many more hands an hour. And a lot of people don't quite understand what that means. Um, when you get a fantastic dealer in a live game, you're looking at 25 to 30 hands an hour. Um, online, you could easily fire up uh, six to eight six-handed tables and get in something like 600 hands an hour. So uh, here, I just went ahead and bluffed the turn um, because there's a lot of jacks in my perceived range here uh, when I complete. I don't really have much equity, really any equity if I'm called, probably. Um, and then on this river, seven of diamonds, I think uh, there's not enough value if I go for a bet, especially multi-way. Um, and then I can safely check fold because I don't expect any of these players or many of them to turn their hands into a bluff. In other words, if someone had a uh, bottom pair, ace high, I don't really expect uh, for them to bluff there. With the sevens, we have an open limper, um, which is pretty much always a mistake in this... Uh, in a game of this many people. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and isolate him, just assuming that he's limping with the intention of calling. Um, I'm getting pretty close to direct odds if this guy's 20, ch 20 chip bet uh, got through, but now we have a, a little cute raise here. This would be a great spot for uh, Menanga, or however you want to say it, to lead out here. Uh, even just open jam. Yeah, so something like uh, King-8, I think, is a fantastic candidate to just open jam. And, um, yeah, let's see if I can fast forward here. Yeah, he did have the 8 of spades, which, you know, is a small consideration. Uh, I'm actually just going to try to create a multi-way pot here. I don't think there's a ton of value in isolating, because I'm always getting called, and King-9 isn't uh, a hand where I want to play a large pot um, with uh, with a potentially dominated hand. So unfortunately, you know, this would have been a fantastic flop for our hand. You know, we're pretty much happy to get it in against anything you can name with the pot size being this large. Um, but our real worry is preflop being dominated, and it looks like, yeah, that was the case. Um, well, on the bright side, we were not going to win that one. Uh, also, on the bright side, just a, um, a little secondary or ancillary benefit of that is now we have the big chip stack on our right, so we don't have to worry about getting bullied as often once the uh, blinds go up, which is happening next hand, and um, we can play some, some better poker where we have more answers about what's going to be happening post-flop. So... When you have a, a big stack to your left, it's very difficult because they're easy. Um, you know, it, it's easy for them to re-steal against you. So you know, say the blinds go up to twenty-five fifty uh, coming up next round, and I make it one twenty-five. That's a pretty sizable portion of my stack. 
Um, if I'm in the small blind, say maybe I make it 150 and I get jammed on, um, like am I going to call it off with that ace 8 or whatever it might be? Um, it could be a tough decision. So a larger stack could put me in that position, whereas a smaller stack has to worry about busting as well. And we're going to play a much different preflop game a lot of the time, you know, assuming there's uh, no like money bubble involved. And so if you guys didn't know, with six people, uh, the top two get paid in a sit and go. So the money bubble becomes like a pretty real consideration very quickly, which I like a lot because a lot of people in tournaments misplay the money bubble. So if you guys are unfamiliar with that, um, essentially what happens is because only the top two people get paid, there is a big incentive just to remain in the game. So if you have one of the larger stacks, you can really put the uh, the shorter stacks under a lot of pressure. Um, they're heavily incentivized to fold, which means you are heavily incentivized to steal and um, you know keep up that pressure. So it's a good time for you as a larger stack just to gradually increase your, your chip stack um, without much risk. So here if I get checked to, I'm probably going to be betting at least once. Uh, I could see him taking this stab uh, with a ton of hands, maybe even something like ace-10, where he just open limped, hoping I would raise, and then, you know, he might do something crazy. Even if he has a hand like queen-10, he might stab like this, and I think a lot of weaker players do that a bit too often. So rather than just draw um, in position with our hand, so we have a gutter and an overcard, so if a 3 comes or a 9 comes, I think we have the best hand uh, almost always. Um, rather than just draw, I like to just to raise, and I think that way we can cut down on a lot of hands that might bluff the turn and stop us from drawing, like if it bets too largely for a gut shot and, you know, what's hopefully still an overcard to the board to uh, draw out on it. Uh, this way we can kind of take the initiative in the hand and get him to fold a lot of those uh, six out hands that have a good amount of equity against us. That's a big, uh, it's a big consideration in poker, especially once you start to get shorter stacked like this, because we can start piling on the pressure, saying like, "Hey, okay, it's pretty clear that you know I'm at least uh, reasonably happy with my hand, because a big percentage of my chip stack is going in the middle. Um, as long as you don't overdo it." then you're not really opening yourself up to um, getting uh, re-raised all the land against on the flop. So something to think about there. But also, and I think more importantly in games like this and probably a lot of the games that you guys play in, um, is that a lot of people just aren't going to make that third re-raise unless they have a hand. But they are, like we kind of postulated, or you know, like we kind of guessed, it's pretty likely that they are going to take that initial stab too often. So because of that, uh, we can just get away with that raise pretty much scot-free. And even their good hands, if they have something as strong as like a6 there, um, when we had 9-5 on that 6-4-2 board, we're going to get to see the turn. And most of the time, we're going to get to see the river. You know, we can give up on the turn and try to hit our 3 or 9 uh, we might hit it on the turn, uh, we might be able to bluff on the turn, and, you know, there shouldn't be really that many check raises all ends going on. So, uh, on this board texture, I expect to be called a lot on the flop because this connects with so many hands, especially gut shots. So I'm not going to bet largely. There's no reason to bet largely if I expect to be called so often, uh, because if I want to bluff uh, at all, I want my bluffs to get through with a, a pretty good price. Um, the board also favors me slightly in that it's ace high and I don't expect my opponent to just call preflop with a lot of ace high hands. And so you might notice that I'm raising to this smaller size. Um, that's just so it uh, keeps the stack to pot size ratio a bit smaller. Uh, and I elected to check back here. I think betting is okay, but if you have a reasonably aggressive opponent, they... Um, might try to check raise you off your hand. Uh, I think it's an interesting decision. It's very similar whether or not to bet on the turn. And now we have an interesting situation on the river where if he checks, uh, I can try to bet and represent something uh, 
you know, along the lines of just a, a double check backhand like pocket fours. Now that's counterfeited, I, I think for that reason you need to value bet ace high at least some of the time. And again, against a, a good player, you're going to get check raise uh, all in there as a bluff or for value a decent amount of the time. So if someone is um, doing that out of proportion, bet calling a hand like ace high, as crazy as it might sound, can be an actually amazing play there. So there's a lot of good benefits to being able to bet a hand as weak as ace high there. Um, it's protecting us when we need to bluff a hand like pocket fours. Um, and also if our opponent's overdoing it with his check raises, we can snap him off. Uh, then the more observant of you will note that, you know, if ace high is your best hand, then our opponent can check raise the river with impunity. If we're always betting ace high and we're always betting pocket fours, then a check raise uh, from our opponent can essentially have perfect information, uh, which means sometimes we want to check back a hand like a 10 or queen x and snap off that check raise and expect to beat a hand that might be value betting. You don't need to do that that often. Even 10% of the time uh, that you're betting different hands there is going to make a massive difference in the total expected value of that betting strategy. And so that might be a good little homework lesson for you guys to try out. Um, do two different expected value calculations and see which one uh, comes out on top. But of course you have to compare that to betting that queen uh, earlier anyway. So here's kind of an odd spot. Um, yeah, okay, this is perfect. So we're hoping it would get checked around because you cannot really credibly represent an ace that often. Uh, this bet size of 200 just makes so little sense, but because um, these players are a bit weaker on average, I'm just going to go ahead and um, just toss it because I've seen a few players in these games just smash uh, the large bet button whenever they have it and there's not much rhyme or reason to it so that's one thing um, another thing is the other player when he bet when a uh, guitar man bet so largely only had 510 chips so to me that says most of the time he's at least committed against uh, the shorter stack so you know, that makes me want to fold a little bit more than like floating, uh, you know, calling and then trying to represent a bluff later in the hand, for instance. Here, I really hate these like over limping situations, but I think uh, Veo has shown that he's been playing passively enough preflop. I don't expect him just to jam here and try to pick up the pot. And Guitar Man is just loose passive as well. So if it checked to us, maybe we could take a stab at it expecting that if we got called uh, by Veo a decent amount of the time that it would be a hand like 8x and our queen or a 10 on the turn or river could get us the best hand. Uh, not that many people at lower stakes games or something you guys might find comparable will just check and call a hand like trips, especially short stacked like that. They kind of figure like, well, you know, if he's betting something that he's happy with, he's just going to go ahead and get it in anyway, so I might as well get it in and really not weigh the uh, the entire equation there, which is if you have trip kings on a king-king-8 board, you're not worried about too much. Uh, and also, your weaker hands aren't really that happy check-raising uh, because the result isn't a very favorable one. So if you're a shorter stack and you're check-raising all in, with a hand like eight nine, offering your opponent a good cho er, a good uh, a good incentive as far as pot odds go. You know, yeah, you might get them to fold a hand like queen ten, and that's great. Um, but also, it's very difficult for that person to make that large of a mistake against you. So, yeah, I mean, there, there's not a ton of incentive there for him to uh, do much else. So I like these uh, this structure because the blinds go up reasonably quickly, but it's not like insane. So it's not just a uh, bingo here. It's it's wild. Sometimes you get players who sit out. I think mostly it's an internet connectivity issue. Um, and then in a typical sit and go, what you'll find, and I don't think this is 
at all like play money related necessarily. Um, a typical sit and go what you'll find is that maybe the top few players will be solid and the bottom few players are abysmal. So you might have something like this happen where like, okay, this guy sits out and he doesn't care. This guy open limps when he has a four big blind stack and just doesn't understand what's happening. This is an interesting spot. So if I move in, do I expect this to get through very often? Uh, I think so, because I would expect anything uh, reasonable just to jam. Um, so it looks like it did not here, I, though we got lucky in, on the river here and hit the uh, super nuts. Um, yeah, I would expect him to move all in with pretty much anything. So a smaller raise might mean that he's looking for a cheap um, cheap big line steal. Uh, it might also mean that he's just trying to get out of here. So I jammed here. Um, you know, before I jammed, this guy was sitting out, I think, it was very close to when he came back in. But either way, that's a pretty standard all-in. And now, all of a sudden, you guys can see we're at kind of bubble territory. This guy can try to hang on for dear life. Uh, I don't I don't see why he would change his mind here if he's open limping with four big blinds uh, trying to survive. The blinds are going to eat him up here pretty soon. But uh, what's more important is we have more chips than everyone else at the table and we can put everyone else at risk. Anytime this guy does anything, he's pretty much committing himself. What a great play would be from Guitar Man would be to call, and then we could try to eliminate this guy together, getting us all closer to the money. But looks like he's happy just to uh, not do that. Um, a lot of players, we're, de we're definitely not expecting them to play the, the bubble uh, anywhere close to optimally. So here I have a king. He has four big lines, yeah, uh, just under five big lines, easy all in. Um, again, we expect him to even fold here some of the time, which is hilarious. So he makes the, the right call. Uh, we don't have many outs. Uh, yeah, so we miss, and he's, he's pretty much back in it. So that's why, um, you know, the short stack poker is so high variance, but also, if you have people who just don't understand exactly what hands, and I mean almost exactly, what hands that they need to go with and what hands they need to toss when it's around 10 big blind stacks for everyone, there are pretty big edges because they are going to be folding 10% uh, of the time, 20% of the time too often, and that's going to create just a huge edge for you. So while when the chips go in, the variance is high, the chips aren't going in nearly as often as they should be if everyone are playing closer to optimal poker. It's not nearly as aggressive. Like you see, we have a lot of folding. When this guy has five and a half big lines, we have an open limp from the small blind. Who knows what that means? I would assume this guy probably is pegged us as overly aggressive here. So he might be slow playing a bit more often, but there's no real reason for him to get... Um, overly involved with us as the two of us are the the larger stack sizes so here i have a jack he has five big lines again it's an easy all-in um turns out he, he picked up a monster that time and again he is back in it so all right that's kind of the name of the game you got to win one of these races and if you're lucky enough to participate in uh three or four of them before you bust then hey all good. Uh, I like 250 because it does not commit me against an all-in raise if I do have something very weak uh, and you want to be able to represent that you can raise and fold. So if I raise to something like 300 there, um, even if I have four or five suited, I'm mathematically committed to calling an all-in uh, or I could make a mistake and fold. But if you guys look at the mathematics there, here's maybe another homework lesson your opponent, if he can have ace-king, uh, I mean, <laughs> in his range will be a lot wider than that. He should have ace-queen and, and maybe a few worse hands. Um, then you're just, your pot odds are too good with even a hand like 4-5. So yeah, sometimes we'll have jacks and you're a massive underdog. But, you know, even with ace-king, he's only a 2-1 to one favorite. So you're looking pretty good to have a massive stack going into uh, the end of a tournament here. 
Uh, notice this guy's open limping quite a bit. Um, now facing this bet, it's a bit interesting. To me, this smaller bet doesn't scream draw. Um, and now we have an interesting turn card. He could represent this credibly, whereas we cannot. So I would assume that his hand is probably slightly better than ours. If we get checked to again, I would consider bluffing uh, if it were another heart. Uh, as it is, I'm going to try to show down, but I don't expect to win that often. All right. So yeah, I mean, basically exactly like we call it. A, a similar hand, but I don't think we could really represent too much. Uh, let's see, we have four or five. I mean, still in the five big blind area. I think now our opponent is probably sort of feeling it a little bit in that, uh, you know, he, he probably thinks 900 chips is different than when he had 500 chips before. Uh, and here I'm going to get a little cute. Uh, if you were to do anything besides move all in here, I would say it's probably a mistake um, against observant players, but these guys are not. Uh, so I'm just trying to get some action for my kings. Unfortunately, it fails, and that's pretty incredible since I think, uh, especially for Guitar Man, even if I showed him kings, you know, he's getting uh, probably close to 4-1 to one preflop, and I'm going to get it in on most boards, so he has some implied odds there. In other words, um, he can sort of already count the, uh, the rest of my chips as uh, pot odds for himself a lot of the time, if he has anything reasonable, so... If the probability even that he makes two pair is uh, decent there, then um, yeah, I think he should just kind of go for it. Here, I have four nine. Uh, we've raised when he's made this bet into us a, a time before, and he just uh, is stabbing in these spots so often after he open limps that I think we just need to go with this weak top pair here and be pretty happy about it. So now here's another weird spot. I'm going to make a very, very, very tight fold uh, because Guitar Man has been absurdly tight preflop, and this raise is saying, "Hey, I'm committed. Uh, I'm committing myself to either of you." So ended up being a, a slight mistake on that fold, but we did know he had a hand strong enough to go for it. There's no chance that we could have gotten out of there alive um, had he done anything else. Um, I mean, if we move all in, he's certainly calling. We know that for a fact. That's another reason why you um you want to be able to represent ideally that you can um you can raise and fold. So whatever he has here, I think is probably a slight mistake. He might be putting us into some sort of tough spot with a hand like five six. He plans to bet call in some odd way, but I think most players would try to check raise that all in. Whatever he has there is just oddly played because a, a king high board for us is a great one to continuation bet. Um, and then for him to lead out there doesn't make too much sense because we should have hands like ace king and king queen, whereas uh, he really shouldn't if he's playing aggressively enough preflop. Here with nine high, there's just not much to be said about it. I can't really represent an ace. I can't really represent a king that often. Um, so I'm just going to try to check this one down. I uh, did not expect a win. That's pretty absurd. So uh, on the bright side, we got to see what he's open limping with, and it is not good, as expected, for someone who's open limping that frequently. You know, sometimes you might see someone do or take an action um, a couple times in a row, and, you know, you can call it whatever you want to call it. Um, here we're abusing the fact that we're on the money bubble a little bit and try to get some tighter folds. Uh, especially from the small blind. But yeah, so Guitar Man taking the same action two or three times, okay, whatever. Him doing it every single time, I think we should be moving all in with 100% of our hands here and just expecting him to fold so often that it just doesn't even matter what we have. Here, uh, B Free has great pot odds to call with almost anything. He's sitting there with uh, four big blinds, a little over four. Um, yeah, we should be getting it in against so many worse hands. I'm not sure if he was away from the computer, but anything with an ace in it, you know, you're pretty happy to call <laughs> with five big ones. So, uh, now we're kind of back around 
average stack size, maybe slightly below. Um, and every single hand is probably shove or fold at this point. We have eight big blinds um, and we're three handed. So definitely anything reasonable is getting moved in preflop. Uh, another consideration is the top two positions get paid. And uh, if anyone is at risk, it's a lot more difficult for them to call it off. So that means we should be moving all in slightly more often and other players should be calling all ins slightly less often just based on that prize pool jump. So I hate the size once again of 700. It's pretty ridiculous. You might as well move all in if you're going to move all in. Um, and I mean, if you're going to raise and fold, doing it with such a large bet doesn't serve a purpose at all. It's a, uh, it's essentially saying like, Hey, I'm all in, but without moving all in. So there might be a few hands that could see a flop and make a better decision uh, post-flop. And you're just allowing your opponent that extra strategic option. You're not putting pressure on him when you could be by moving all in. This button open limp is pretty terrible uh, unless maybe it's an exploitive attempt is something like aces to try to allow one of us to hit a top pair and then go with it. Um, even then, I mean, it, it should be fairly transparent if everyone's playing well. Like if you jams here and I'm sitting here and I have 8-9, I'm not happy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we all know Guitar Man's going with it here. Uh, I mean, even if he shows him aces at this point, it's just, hey, yikes. That's uh, pretty god-awful all around. You know, uh, slow playing sevens on the button, six big blinds deep. You're not really getting much done. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move in, because if you think sevens is a good slow play, I don't really see him uh, snapping us off with, like, queen six here, uh, which he should be, or it's at least close. Uh, so a lot of the hands, as I mentioned before, this is where we're really getting our edge. If we can get heads up against Freeman, that would be amazing, because I think we steal a lot of medium-sized pots pre-flop that we have no business taking down so that's our current hope it's nice that he has some chips now if it you know if it's not us i hope it's him guitar man uh not that he's playing particularly well with his like overly large raise sizes and uh his very frequent open limping uh i think i'd much rather play against freeman because he just completely undervalues his hands um we're gonna try to see a flop here with seven four suited uh, nothing that great materializes, and I don't really even like taking a stab at this board that often because it just connects with so many hands that other players could have. Um, and if we do get called, I don't expect to have a lot of equity on a lot of different turn and river combinations. So, wow, a uh, huge hand here. We got to see the old, the old snap pot, um, by B Free. So we're going to go ahead and elicit the old cooperation play uh, even though our hand is complete crap what we're doing here is we're just teaming up to try to take out guitar man um nothing else so ideally one of us hits a pair looks like it's b free thankfully uh all right so we're in the money uh not a lot of chips but all good so we're getting paid that's the main thing now we have this monster hand sevens so time to start chipping up here is where I would expect to get a lot of folds anyway, uh, but sevens, there's just far too many overcards that could come, and I think we need to um, protect against that other than trying to get cute like he did. 8-4 is, I, I don't even think it's borderline for this stack size, but we're getting far too many folds. I think 100% uh, of the time we should be moving all in uh, as the button. When he open limps the button, you know, I get a little worried, but not too worried. Here I'm going to bet uh, 300 and that's going to set us up for a nice river all in for about three quarters of the pot as well. So we're going three quarters, three quarters. So this will make the pot um, 1400 and then we'll be moving all in on the river. Now we're over 10 big ones so we have a, a few strategic options. I think it's better, or no, we aren't. I'm sorry. That should be an all in but I, I think this is fine because we can get some calls from some worse hands and now I'm just going to bet sizes that uh, tempt him into making mistakes. So him check calling with something like seven, nine of clubs here or whatever he might have. 
trying to get some value from her ace high. On a, a board like that, that's about as safe as it gets. So now we're up to 10 big blinds, and I think we have some more options just uh, besides calling or shoving. Uh, check check on this board. I think we can get a little, little aggressive and go after it here. Um, he's just been extremely passive, so yeah, let's go. It's not like the craziest play in the world, but oh, get out of here, update. Oh, nice top pair. All right, so here what we're going to do is I'm going to lead out because I think a, a lot of worse hands will actually give us action here. And if we do get raised, oddly enough, I think I could fold pretty safely uh, against this player. So uh, lots of good to be done there. And now I'm happy just to see flops. There's no reason for these medium strength hands to force high variance action when we don't need to. Uh, and so now we have the nuts. Uh, I want to raise because we're going to try to put him into a tough spot with a flush draw. I'm not sure what he has, but I don't expect to be called that often. I don't expect to get much action either way. So rather than give him a free card, um, yeah, I'm just going to try to get in the chips. Hey, yo. All right. Three deuce on a board like this. Um, again, I think now is a fine time to just go after it, get aggressive. Yeah, we can take these spots far too often. He's folding his king highs, his ace highs, just way too often. Jack four, um, not strong enough to raise. I don't expect to get raised against uh, too often. And now let's just try to chip away. Jack-10 uh, should be good enough here if he completes to move in against him to try to steal. Um, and doo -doo 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 -doo. same thing, Queen-8. Uh, I'd much rather move in with a hand like this, uh, whereas Jack-10 has a little bit more post-flop playability. It looks like maybe he's picking up his raising frequency here. Uh, and now I'm just going to limp. I'm definitely doing this uh, too often. I would not do this against a better player. And I just expect to be able to stab post-flop and win it much more often. Okay, yeah, he's, he's certainly picking up his raising frequency unless he's just gotten very lucky the, very, uh, the past five or six hands, and I don't think that's very likely. So now we have bottom pair on this uh, fairly connected board. I'm just going to check it back, try to get the showdown. Luckily we're improved. If he bets out something like this, I think it's advantageous for us to jam. We're going to run into something strong sometimes, but I think a lot of the time it's just a combination draw. Um, you know, whatever. If he hits that river, he hits it. But we got it in great. Um, now we're off to the races. So hopefully we can hold against whatever it is. If he does something stupid like open limping, I think there's a good amount of value in just checking. Um, there's literally no hand he should have folded there, even 2-3 offsuit. So it's nice that he is that clueless. Um, yeah, luckily he, he got it in as a 2-1 to one favorite, finally. Didn't even win. So, all right. Now we're uh, back to being in decent shape. He's open limping. I think we're going to try to just go for it, yeah. 3-5, uh, even with how passively he's been playing, that's just too trash of a hand to get cute with, you know, something like 12% of our chip stack. Same thing here, if it goes check, check, I'm fine, just checking this one down. Um, we have no equity if called, which kind of hurts our case. I think also he's just expecting us to um, stab. We've been doing it pretty often. 
So all of a sudden, boom, we're down to three big blinds basically. So anything at all is good for an all-in here. Anything at all is great for him to call even two, three. So whatever he folded there, big, big mistake. Um, very happy to get it all in however we can here. Um, you know, if he has a better hand, he has it. I find a lot of the time uh, when blinds get this large and people have these like uh, strategies of habitually limping, that they'll start limp calling hands like four or five suited, which is just extremely strange to me. So we might even get it in ahead a lot of the time that way, which is fine. So now all of a sudden we're back up to even stacks. Um, all we've been doing is moving all in, all we've been doing is folding. So you guys can see even just a few hands later with the uh, the blinds as large as they are, it just does not matter. Um, and this looks maybe a little aggressive. It's probably on the edge against a, a player who will call you properly against this player, not close. Um, he's just folding far too frequently. He might be folding uh, you know, 30% of his hands that he should have been calling this with. 3-5 again is just trash. Uh, I would say it's probably slightly tight against this player to fold. Uh, I couldn't fault anyone who would move all in there. But when I get like the worst possible hand, I like to mix it up and fold just so our opponent thinks that we have some sanity left in us maybe. Um, otherwise you get like tilt calls like I was saying from that 4-5 suited type of range. Um, and now what's interesting is if he does move all in, I mean, I'm still calling because, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it's just so advantageous for us to call and then I'll lead out on the off chance he folds something like this, but, uh, all good. We take it down. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hope you learned something, even though it's play money, I still think there's tons to be learned, but, uh, you know, subscribe and, uh, give the video a like, uh, let me know in the comment section if you give a damn about that play money. Later guys.